Bene, qua siamo in una nuova sede. Nuova We are sede. in a new venue, a new venue for our conferences. As you know, uh, we usually meet at the Colosseum Theatre, but uh, for the past few years, every now and again, uh, we move to the university in the poly. Usually the university means uh, the lecture hall, but this is a uh, main lecture hall, but this is a new venue. Lots of new things this uh, year. Another new thing that you might have seen that is new for this edition is that object which you can see here. It's a gong, a gong uh, uh, which uh, has a very specific uh, aim, and that is uh, to be played. Uh, to announce a moment of the conference which might be particularly interesting because you want more details or because it's not clear or because it refers to something uh, which one should remind. But who are the people who decide whether they're going uh, to have more details? There are two volunteers uh, that we volunteered. We forced them and I asked them to come here now. Please, would you like to join us and uh, sit down to the right and to the left of the gong? Don't pretend you didn't know. Ah, we could have also asked, are there two volunteers? Yes, two. Troppi volontari. Incredibile. Too many volunteers, unbelievable. Uh, but what about uh, Thursday, December the 14th? You're booked. I would like to now call on the volunteers to take the uh, mic, not to be confused with the gong. That's fine. Otherwise, you have uh, the uh, roaming mic. Uh, Please introduce yourselves, uh, name, etc. My name is Alice. My name is Enrico. I'm in year two of agrarian studies. I'm on year three. So you're not here by chance, uh, both because this is not your usual venue, your usual campus. Uh, yes. We had heard of this event, uh, and so of this conference in particular, yes. So we decided to come and listen. It's a topic that we're very interested in. But you're also Giovedi Scienza fans, aren't you? Yes. I came at the col to the Colosseum. Uh, theater, but that was the first time. This is the second one. Well, two out of three is a good percentage. It's Let's uh, just try the gong out. You have to get up, go in front of the gong and uh, sound it. Yes, I think you can hear it. At this point, uh, you have a mic possibly use a per roaming per mic, and you can ask a question. You have a question each, and you can interrupt only once each during the conference. Now, we're going to move on to this evening's topic. Last week, we spoke about uh, bacteria, uh, yeast, and microorganisms within us, inside us, uh, and microorganisms uh, that are used for fermentation to produce uh, wine and beer in particular. This uh, week is a sort of follow-on because we will be talking about agriculture, as the conference announced. That is to say, transformation of nature nature and how it changed over time. We will also be talking about bacteria, but our speaker will correct me if we've made mistakes. 
in introducing him uh, because uh, we've been using it. But before introducing our speaker, I would like uh, to give the floor to Paola Bonfante of the Department of Life Science and Biology of Systems at the University of Turin because thanks to her that we have the speaker I will be introducing. I'm small, so you can see me better. Grazie Alberto. Cosa right. posso dire che tutto il pubblico Thank you very much Alberto. What can I say? All the audience uh, uh, that loves uh, Giovedi Scienza knows that for the past 30 years, since 87, we tried to cover all the most advanced fields of research and science, a big effort of communication and updating. Personally, I am a plant biologist, and so I said, how many times in 30 years have you used the word plant? So I went through the various uh, titles, and I saw that, in fact, this word, although was only mentioned three or four times. So at that point, the Science uh, uh, Steering Committee of Giovedi Scienza said, yes, we have to make up for that in this cycle because we're all aware of the fact that plants are one of the central focus for the environment, but also for agriculture and farming. And as we learn from primary school, agriculture is the basis of society and of human living. But to have advanced uh, agriculture and farming, uh, you have to be well versed in plants. Uh, so who can answer these uh, two questions? That is to say the word uh, study of plants and agriculture farming, Professor Morgante. So I'm not going to give uh, his uh, curriculum, uh, but I would like to just mention two points which I think are extremely important. First of all, as a researcher, he founded a very important center, this lab, which is called IGA, the Institute of Applied Genomics in Udina, which represents um, a place where all the most advanced technologies are used. And thanks also to the use of these technologies, he gave us some, uh, he contributed on the, to the study of the genome of plants. Uh, and what he'll be talking about today is uh, the role of the so called pangenome, uh, which he was one of the main discoverers of, but uh, also Professor Morgan is uh, also uh, as president uh, of uh, the Society of Agrarian Genetics uh, has felt the importance uh, of communication and popularization not to the audience uh, but to the world of politics and he's organized uh, for instance uh, very important meetings and conferences uh, such as the one uh, which uh, uh, was on genes uh, this year so what can we do to improve Italian agriculture with innovative uh, uh, technologies uh, such as uh, this uh, uh, new genetic approach. So thank you very much, Michele, for having accepted to come. I would like to now call Michele Morgante to come here. I will not add anything else to his presentation except for the fact that his research group has sequenced the genome of vines, and this uh, links us also to last week's work. At the end of the meeting, you can ask any questions you wish to. Michele Morgante. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Thanks, uh, Paola, for having thought about me. I hope uh, that I will uh, meet her expectations. I'm very pleased uh, to be here in Turin. The topics we'll be talking about this evening are the role of uh, genetics in agriculture and farming. If uh, someone uh, wondered what was in this image, which was also on the website. What this image shows is the impact of genetic modification in agriculture for centuries. These 
are vine flowers. They have been demasculated. The anthers that contain the pollen have been removed, and with that brush, you cross them with another variety. So this is to have a cross between the two, and with the results, the cross, uh, we will select the ones uh, that have the best uh, features. This is what was done for many, many centuries, uh, and uh, which many people think uh, we should continue to do here without uh, making use uh, of what in the past decades uh, science has made available. We don't quite understand why we should be limited uh, in using progress of science and technology, while in other fields this doesn't happen. I'm going to give you an example uh, which uh, hit uh, the very paper headlines in the past weeks and was also published in Nature last week. And uh, that is a very famous case where science uh, has made it possible to do something that would not have been possible otherwise. What you can see in the photo, in photo A, is a seven-year-old child who in 2015 was admitted to the Burns Center in Bochum. The child suffered of a genetic disease, which is a f very bad, but fortunately very rare, which is called epidermolysis bullosus. It's to do with a fault of a gene, the laminin beta-3 gene, and this means that the skin of the child progressively falls off, detaches. When he came to the hospital, he had lost two-thirds of his skin, and uh, he uh, was uh, uh, kept in a drug-induced coma to avoid pain. There was no possibility to save him. Now, what happened is that 24 months later, the child is home, he has a normal life, he's playing like any other child and no longer needs to take drugs. How is that possible? It was possible thanks to a team of work led by Michele De Luta, an Italian, who was in Turin last Saturday, and so it's something which Italy can be very proud of. And what Michele did was to take from some skin residual skin, some stem cells of the child to culture them and then to uh, act genetically on these cells. He added a transgene uh, which was able to produce uh, the functional protein which was faulty in the child. What we uh, did in Udine, thanks uh, to the sequencing techniques uh, which we have, was to characterize uh, uh, the square meter of skin uh, that was obtained by the regeneration uh, that started with the stem cells. This uh, was then grafted onto the child with three different uh, surgical operations, uh, and uh, then after that, the child uh, was able uh, to be cured. The child is a transgenic at this point uh, person. His uh, cells uh, have various insertions of uh, this uh, um, result of this new skin, uh, which is able to code uh, for the beta-3 protein. And if we compare it to transgenic plants, uh, uh, which are normally called uh, GMO plants, uh, this is a slightly different situation, because in this case, uh, not all the body of the child was made transgenic, but only part of it, a uh, specific uh, tissue. And uh, the event uh, cannot uh, certainly be passed on to future generations, because it has nothing to do with the germinal line, but it is also true that for someone like me, who always uh, has to discuss uh, on uh, GMOs, I'm certainly very surprised that the problem, the uh, transgenetic uh, materials, is not really raised when we talk about agriculture or farming. This fact uh, that clearly in this case made it possible to do something which would not have otherwise happened is more easily accepted. Now, what does it depend on? Probably it depends on a different perception, not so much of the risks, because if we talk about risks, the risks for the child are higher than the ones that you could have in having a transgenic action on a plant, because 
every plant, every transgenic plant, contains one insertion. Here we're talking about uh, hundreds of insertions uh, that in some cases could have had some side effects. Uh, that's talking about the child. But what um, changes the perception of benefits? Uh, unquestionably, in the case of the child, it saved his life. But in the case of agriculture, for some reason, public opinion partly channeled by people who have an interest to think this uh, can't see what the benefits can be for society as well as for agriculture in using certain technologies uh, which are strongly innovative and to use them in agriculture. What I will be doing is I'm going to project a short film which will show you the point of view of the Italian scientific community on the most recent technology, which is genome editing. Then on the basis of the short video clip, I will, it talks about progress and benefits, obviously. And after that, I, we will try to discuss the element more in depth and we'll see why and how we got to where we got. Before, tasting the fruit, uh, Adam and Eve didn't have to worry about anything. We, on the other hand, ever since uh, farming and agriculture started, we've tried to improve plants. Over thousands of years, the genetic improvement uh, has become a sine qua non, something very important and safe for us and for the environment. In any way, it was developed. Nowadays, there is a new way to improve plants. It's called genome editing. It's more powerful and simpler, and therefore even more useful. It's more accurate, so it's even safer. It's very well suited to Italian agriculture. It can improve typical varieties without changing them and can be used by small farm holdings and can appreciate also and benefit from the knowledge of our scientists. According to the international scientific community, genome editing does not produce GMOs. But if the European Union will decide to consider them GMOs according to a regulation that predates genome editing, no one will be able to grow them. In fact, these plants have improvements that nature could introduce, uh, such as the ones which uh, mark the beginning of agriculture. So why not treat them in the same way? This uh, film was uh, shot by the Italian Society of, of Agrarian Genetics. Why are we forced in one way to use a means of communication like this uh, to develop a message or circulate a message uh, which should be very easy to accept. Now the reason is uh, that probably what is happening today is uh, that there is a big gap between the agricultural world and the society so those who are not inside the world of farming and agriculture have a distorted perception of what it is. It's seen as uh, maybe a very uh, uh, traditional, bucolic activity than what it is in fact. At the same time, many people who are outside agriculture don't fully understand what sort of benefits agriculture gives us. Unquestionably, agriculture, ever since its inception, has made it possible for us uh, to find a solution to what is essential for any living being, that is to say, to nourish, to find nourishment. Uh, this is very important because we have a lot of food, good quality food on our tables, uh, but although this is not true for all the world, certainly it is true for an important uh, uh, part uh, of the world. And agriculture has greatly contributed to this, uh, freeing human beings uh, uh, from a series of daily tasks. But agriculture, and in particular technological developments in agriculture, have also made it possible 
uh, for us uh, not to be so affected by weather. Let us not forget that uh, in the 30s of the last century in the US, uh, for instance, uh, there was uh, the Dust Bowl event, uh, so there was drought for many years. So this led to a famine, and this uh, is uh, what developed the regionalist movement, uh, which is uh, interpreted also by the picture that you just saw. Thanks to technological progress uh, that has taken place ever since then, events such as that uh, would not happen again, because now, thanks to a series of technologies uh, that are available within the farming area or farming industry, we would be able to cope with exceptional situations uh, such as those. Now, if you can start thinking about how such uh, technology develops, uh, uh, you can uh, think of it uh, as uh, progress uh, through three different routes. It's a three-pronged progress. Uh, first of all, improving the genetic, uh, uh, genetics of a plant, uh, making them uh, better suited uh, uh, to farming. This has been done for thousands of years, and it basically corresponds to the history of farming. The second one is uh, the plant can't be changed on its own to use chemistry to change it. Uh, this may, might mean fertilizers, it might also mean substances like pesticides, uh, or how one can uh, defend the plants from bacteria, fungi, and other such pests. And then we have the agronomic techniques, that is to say all the techniques that can help plants produce better, use less water. Nowadays, people talk about digital farming, digital agriculture, precision agriculture, and this is part of it. And we think that it'll play a very important role in the future. However, if we look back into the past, uh, and very often the past is useful because it helps us uh, forecast the future. The past tells us that the genetic improvement of plants uh, is uh, what has most contributed to progress in agriculture. And if the number you see there, more than 50%, that is to say genetics alone are responsible for more than 50% of the increase of productivity, it's increasing. Genetic modification of plants that have taken place over the past thousand years have been essential. As I mentioned, it is a process that has nothing new. It started a long, long time ago. It started a few millennia ago when in various parts of the planet various plants were domesticated. That is to say, they were farmed, they were grown. Some of them, well, all of them, in fact, were wild plants originally, clearly. And they were genetically modified through trial and error. I'm going to give you an example. That's maize or sweet corn. Which is the wild plant and which is the one which we farm now? I would say it'd be, they're very different, aren't they? The wild plant still grows uh, in Mexico. It is uh, called uh, Teosinti or Zia plant. And you can see the part, if you look at the part which is most interesting, what we normal call a cob, but which is called an ear. Teosinti, or the zia plant, has very few seeds, while the maize we eat has a cob with lots of seeds. And also, the teosinti uh, grains are covered um, in um, a very thick skin, while the maize hasn't got it, uh, with the former being best for popcorn. Now, this is a very important concept, uh, and people don't quite understand, and that is to say that farmed plants are not the outcome of a natural evolution. They're the result of a very clear selection uh, by humans. Uh, the plants uh, that are they exist today, many of them would not survive alone in nature. In terms of evolution, the main parameter 
is fitness. That is to say, the ability of the plant to adapt to the environment and to re reproduce. Many of the cultivated plants do not scatter their seed. And this in itself means that in nature, they would not be able to reproduce and continue the life of the plant. They're also the result of human beings acting on them. And uh, if human beings had not existed, they would not exist. So they are the most artificial outcome. As far as the products of domestication, which happened many, many thousands of years ago, and which from a genetic point of view was not very complex, because, for example, all the differences that you can see between maize and its wild uh, forefather, so to speak, Tirsinte, uh, are modifications of five genes, and that was enough. In time, the process didn't stop. In fact, uh, it has continued and does still. You can see this is a technique that we all were aware of, and it is crossing and selecting. What you do is that you take two plants uh, that have uh, positive but different features, and you cross them, hoping to get a third that combines the positive features of the two plants. Very often, uh, we have used uh, crosses and selection to transfer resistance to pathogens or, or pests, uh, and this process is recrossing, and in the end, it leads us to have a plant that has a segment of the DNA of the wild species that was more resistant. Here you can see it in green. And this is the one which contains the gene that makes it more resistant to the pathogen, but also maintaining the others. So it's a process which is very traditional process, and in the end, it's a sort of chromosome engineering, quite an accurate one, where a segment of the plant is uh, transferred to the other, or the plant's DNA. Possibly, the genetic innovation that most uh, had uh, an impact on agriculture is the development of um, maize or corn hybrids. When you used to plant a field, they were genetically different amongst themselves, still related but different, so there was cross-pollination. At the beginning of the 20th century, someone in particular, some American genetic specialists uh, thought that it was possible to act in a different manner. That is to say, to make maize or sweet corn a result of plants that were genetically identical, but uh, basically better than the previous population of plants. This is what led to the production of uh, hybrids. As you will observe, the levels of production before the hybrids were about 1.7 ton per hectare. And as you will observe, uh, production did not increase. As from when the hybrids were introduced, uh, and there were two generations of hybrids, uh, what we obtained was, one, an increase in production, but above all, an increase which is still an upward trend. In fact, and now we have about 10 tons per hectare. If, as some in Italy seem to want, we were to go back and uh, to grow the old varieties, in the case of maize, uh, we would have to uh, reduce the, popula the population and therefore the crops down to a sixth of what it is now, which means that we would have to have an enormous surface uh, to farm now, which doesn't exist in our country. As time went by, technologies used to improve genetically have evolved. They have evolved with the progress of knowledge. When we've understood what the genetic material was and that the material coded the biological information, 
In all their complexity, we also understood that it was possible to act on the genetic material and create new variability or new varieties. These are treatments that could be done with radiation, such as gamma rays, or they could be treatments with chemical substances. It is a method that is rather basic in certain respects, because uh, it's like uh, shooting in the dark, hoping that one of the many shots will hit a target. Clearly, the logics of mutagenesis is to generate many new mutations, many more than the ones that would be generated spontaneously, and hope that one of these will give the required effects, such as, for instance, increasing production. It's a technique that, however, BASIC has given very important results. Many, for example, of uh, the varieties of durum wheat are the result of this. Croesus is the most well known. It has and is used, uh, and it is uh, the forebear of many of the varieties that are used in Italy. The next revolution uh, that took place, uh, again answering uh, the progress of uh, science, of biological science, um, and had took place in the 80s, and it followed the development of molecular biology, which makes it possible for us to manipulate uh, DNA, that is to say, genetic material. This. Uh, ability or skill to take a, a piece of DNA out, uh, work on it in vitro, and then reinsert it into another organism is a technology which led us uh, to develop uh, transgenic plants, better known as GMOs, uh, which from a technological point of view are rather old products because they refer to a technology which was first established in 1983 when the first work uh, on uh, these methods uh, were published. It's a methodology uh, which, uh, unlike uh, the common opinion, were not developed in the US, but in European labs, uh, which at the time had been pioneers in uh, developing this new technology. This uh, possibility clearly extended uh, uh, the possibilities of improving plants from a genetic point of view because it's opened the door um, to new opportunities because the pieces of DNA uh, could be taken from, for instance, a different organism, which meant that we could add some characteristics to the plant. Uh, this, for some, is an advantage, and for others, it's a frightening thing. Clearly, it is something which we could discuss uh, for a long time. But maybe the biggest uh, revolution comes later. And that is to say, it starts in the 1990s, uh, and which is still taking place. Uh, and it has to do with technologies uh, that make it possible for us uh, to read and interpret uh, the genetic information which is contained in DNA. That is to say, the development of genomics um, all started uh, with DNA. As you know, DNA is a very simple molecule uh, consisting basically of uh, four different units uh, that are indicated here by the letters A, T, C, G. And it is the combination and sequence of these uh, that holds uh, all our secrets. Uh, the DNA sequence uh, contains all the instructions uh, which are necessary for a or living organism to live. Inside the genome, uh, which uh, contains the uh, genetic information of a, an organism, uh, contains uh, uh, the information that makes it what it is. Uh, the genome of uh, plants uh, may vary in length uh, from uh, hundreds of millions uh, to a hundred or tens of thousands of billions. Uh, and uh, it's very complicated. Uh, there may be, for example, organisms that are comparable with very different length genomes. Small technical problem which I've just solved 
I was saying that what is important is that the number of genes is a constant unlike the length of the genome. And this is a quite uh, constant, if we, even if we compare plants and human beings, uh, in, we have fewer genes, uh, apparently, than uh, plants. Uh, plants have about 30,000, we have about 23,000. So what has happened is that at long last uh, we have had access uh, in an easy and swift manner to all this information. And this information is organized in a rather complex manner. So, however simple it is, ACGT, to generate the complexity of living beings, all of this has to be organized. And the organization is very complex. I think that if we were to draw out a DNA molecule, it would be a couple of meters long, while it is much, much smaller. And this is not a cell, but this is part of a cell we're looking at. So it's the interaction between DNA and a series of other factors, proteins, uh, that the secret of life lies, because DNA is a molecule that has fixed information, but uh, which is accessed in a dynamic manner. In the way in which we open and close this information is uh, the secret of how we obtain uh, the information that leads to the secret of life. What at long last we've managed to do, thanks uh, to a contamination, a very useful contamination of uh, molecular biology with uh, uh, IT and robotics, uh, is uh, to develop uh, a series of technologies uh, that uh, are called omics, uh, very trendy name, which make it possible for us uh, to describe uh, at different levels uh, the biological processes. Uh, for example, we can read the genetic information in the genome of uh, very complex organisms. Uh, for instance, uh, the sequencing of uh, the human uh, DNA cost uh, $3 million in the year 2000, and now to resequence uh, a human uh, genome is $1,000. So you'll realize how it has changed. In fact, paradoxically, in this sector, in uh, genomics and genetics, so we are in a situation where technology has exceeded uh, science, because our ability to produce data on the basis of this technology exceeds uh, uh, the ability that we have to interpret it. Uh, so science hasn't really kept up with technology. But it's uh, like the embarrassment that rich people have, uh, uh, having too much and not being able to do enough with it. Uh, we have too many data, and we don't really know what to do with it. Uh, previously, it was the opposite. Uh, and we lack the possibility of getting basic information. From the point of view of genetic improvement, one might ask oneself, what's the point of all this? Uh, in the end, what's it going to be? Is it going to be progress, for example? Yes, progress for medical science. And the example I gave before was right. And then somebody else might ask themselves, so why is it important to have genetic improvement? Uh, well, genetic improvement is based uh, on the visible okay, characteristics of plants uh, and amongst plants. Uh, selection so far has always uh, acted on visible features uh, without asking ourselves what were the genetic basis underlying these features. This was effective, uh, but uh, this is now more effective. What genomics makes it possible for us to do is to link uh, the uh, 
variation of visible characteristics with the variations of the DNA. And the reason is that we're able to modify the genes that control the features, be it production or resistance to pathogens or pests or to drought or ability to use uh, uh, benefit uh, from fertilizers, for instance. Uh, it also makes it possible for us to identify within these genes the various bases that can be modified. And when modified, we can then tweak them or tweak them uh, to obtain the required effects. And this uh, will certainly improve the traditional process of crossing because uh, rather than only using the visible features or characteristics, uh, we can be based, uh, uh, we can base our research on the uh, features of the DNA. But above all, it makes it possible for us uh, to think uh, that we can generate modifications, uh, targeted modification, instead of having to wait uh, for the natural evolution, which uh, sooner or later would probably produce or would produce uh, the modifications we require, or without introducing, as was expected, random mutations uh, through mutagenic processes, uh, uh, which was a sort of let's hope it works approach. Uh, now we have a possibility which is completely targeted. We know what, say, the gene that uh, gives a uh, high tolerance to drought, and uh, we can then intervene, act on that gene, and thus generate the new features. This is something that we can do with various technologies. For example, we can introduce a gene into a plant, something which we could have had with by crossing. It's called cisgenesis. It was defined as such to distinguish it from the GMO, which that uses transgenetic. It's the difference of the gene uh, that is introduced, not uh, uh, of the technique. In this case, it was a gene that could have been transferred to that plant by crossing it, uh, because it comes from the same species or uh, with a sexually compatible gene. And it is introduced exactly as it would have happened if I'd crossed it. One might wonder why I must do this if in the end it gives me a result which is comparable to the one which I could have by crossing the plant, so why do I need to use this new technology? The reason is a threefold. First of all, it's faster. In one generation, I can get the result that otherwise uh, would require several generations. If this is not a problem in species as such as soy or maize or sweet corn because I can have three or four generations in a year, it is still a problem for other species uh, that are important for Italian agriculture where every generation takes three or four years. Uh, so 10 generations is what we need. It means 30, 40 years. So my students uh, would have to finish it. Uh, I'll be gone. Then the second thing is that it's uh, much more accurate. Uh, when I cross, I don't only transfer the gene I want to transfer, but I will also have other genes of the donor. And these, in some cases, may have uh, uh, undesired effects. Uh, but last, but I think is the most important, uh, and in particular for an agriculture like the Italian one, which uh, has a traditional approach to varieties. Sembra che ci sia una domanda. Abbiamo forse trovato un qualcosa da chiedere, anche se. No, però scusa, non vale. Apparently, there's a question. We'd like to ask you something. No. She played it. We, we'd, we'd agreed on it like that. Then I will be sounding the gong and she will ask the question. Given this introduction on uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, 
We have lots of uh, questions, but I have this one I'd like to ask you now. When we modify the plant genetically, how can we then determine in the case of uh, genome editing, how can we find it again, find that portion that has been edited, and what are the differences between this technique uh, and uh, the one that had been used previously. In what way is it different from transgenetic or cisgenetic plants? I will be dis discussing editing in a few minutes, uh, so I, I'll answer by that. But to identify the sections uh, that have been modified, which is a concern of many people, I think that it's not always justified because compared to other methods, in any case, uh, the undesired mutations are less frequent. But thanks to the technology that I described, thanks uh, to the enormous uh, potential that we have nowadays uh, to analyze DNA sequences, we are able to take any variety that has been edited, going to identify as, and uh, therefore see if there are any other modifications other than the one that we intended to have uh, that are present in the plants. Uh, clearly, from this point of view, technological developments uh, have greatly helped. I was saying that the last aspect whereby a, a technology such as cisgenesis can be used by Italian agriculture is that we've always been proud of our heritage here. Here we're in Piedmont, uh, no need to talk about wines, the importance of Nebbiolo. What would Barolo be without Nebbiolo wine stocks? If uh, we have a cross, uh, these traditional varieties will be lost, but when, because when you cross them, the genetic features of the variety is lost, so we could obtain something similar, but it's not the same. While cisgenesis, uh, just as editing, as we'll see in a moment, will make it possible for us uh, to do the same thing, but maintaining the genetic vari variability of uh, the variety. And this is essential because it means uh, that we can use and have uh, our genetic variability and varieties, uh, but maintain them in today's uh, uh, conditions, which are not the same as the ones they were 500 years ago when that variety was selected. And uh, let's move on now to uh, genome editing, which was the question of our gong. Um, now, the one which most uh, has holds promise is the one which we called genome editing. This is like a dream come true for a genetic expert because it was developed to make it possible not uh, uh, to be rough and ready, like introduce a complete segment of DNA, and has, which is what happens with uh, cisgenesis or transgenesis, but to go there very, in a very precise manner on the single basis and obtain the modification that we wish to have. It is a technology which um, although has been discussed a lot in the past three years, is not so new. There were many attempts in the past. The technology is very simple in its logic, it's an underlying logic. If I want to have a modification in, with reference to a specific base, for example, say I'm talking about vines, I have to cut the a DNA molecule in correspondence to that base. So the gist of it is in guiding a protein that has to cut the DNA to the point where I want to cut it. Once the cut has been generated, then it's perceived as a damage by the cell because a rupture of the DNA strand is considered damage. Um, because it means that the cell cannot replicate the DNA correctly and therefore transfer it uh, to future generations in the course of its uh, cell division. So once there's a cut, the cell tries to repair it. Uh, so uh, the technique can be used in different ways. Uh, first of all, I can cut and then allow it to proceed with random repair. And in this sense, the cell can use uh, the 
mechanism which will lead to random changes. They will happen where I wanted it to, but there could be a replacement of bases which will be random and which I will not be able to see. It's a form of random mutagenesis, but targeted, which happens in only in one place, which is where I wanted it to happen. Then I can also use it in a different way. I can try and guide it, and that's called gene modification because I am also going to supply a short DNA molecule which the cell can use as a template to repair. This molecule which I supply contains the variant that I wish the variety to have in its final product. It's used as a template to repair and the repaired molecule will have a very clearly targeted uh, uh, modification. These are the two that you saw on the, which you can see on the left, which are the most interesting, uh, both uh, for genetic modification and improvement, uh, and also for biomedical research. Uh, although the one which uh, the papers spoke about, uh, and the third that you can see on the right, uh, last uh, week uh, uh, everybody spoke uh, about uh, the Uh, patient in Oakland that had a metabolic disease or where genome editing was used to correct the fault. Well, no, they didn't use uh, editing as could be really used. In this case, it was only used to, to cut his DNA in a precise point. Uh, and at that, in that point, uh, they introduced a transgene to produce the protein which was faulty in the patient, which is a very interesting application, but is not. Uh, the one that is uh, the most uh, fascinating because here you have problems which are linked to transgenesis and cisgenesis. Uh, the only difference is that you're inserting it in a particular point rather than randomly has been done so far. So why has editing become so popular in the past three years? Because finally it's easy. It's easy thanks uh, to the work of two researchers, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudman, uh, two colleagues, uh, two researchers, uh, male researchers, uh, Zhao Feng and George Church. Uh, and although now they're battling on the patents uh, uh, amongst themselves, uh, they gave a joint contribution to biological research, world biological research, because they developed this technique uh, which is used in labs the world throughout because it's so straightforward. It's a system which, uh, as uh, our presenter was saying, it comes from bacteria and that bacteria use when they defend themselves from viruses. This was modified to make it uh, suitable to modify in a targeted manner. And the gist, again, of the system is that I have a protein, which is the one which cuts, that is guided, and will cut in a precise point, and will do so by a small molecule of nucleic acid, which is not DNA but RNA. And its uh, straightforwardness is to do with the fact that, that it's the same protein that cuts, and I can channel it uh, by just modifying the RNA. The system is very simple and uh, it is proving very useful for fundamental research but in future also for applied research, uh, including genetic improvement because one of the uses uh, which one can think of is that of replacing mutagenesis in induced by chemical uh, substances or physical substances, uh, uh, we could have genome editing. What are the advantage that you eliminate any mutations or modifications that you don't want? Uh, and uh, we used to just hope that something good would happen. While with the editing, you have to start with the knowledge. You have to know which gene will give uh, the feature that you wish to, not only which gene, but also which are the bases within the gene that can lead uh, to a variation of the gene as we wish it to be. What are the advantages? Again, time, we, have, we no longer have uh, undesired modifications. Uh, 
And also, we can intervene on existing varieties without having to cross it, which means that uh, we can use the varieties that we already have, uh, modifying it. But many people think that editing will go beyond that and that it will change everything because we will not need to go to complex crosses of plants uh, such as we do. Uh, for example, for maize or sweet corn. And this uh, will combine different variants, um, um, and we can do it very rapidly in one line, thanks to genome editing. What does all this imply? Well, to have genetic improvement nowadays, so we have a series of different technologies that are available. Some of them are traditional ones, uh, to, for example, by crossing or mutagenesis. Then we have uh, GMOs, uh, such as transgenesis or cisgenesis. And then now we have genome editing. We could obtain the same product in some cases with each of these technologies. The paradox of legislation, in particular of the European legislation, is that in spite of the fact that the product is exactly the same, it go falls under different regulations according to the process or technique which is used to obtain it. Take, uh, for example, resistance uh, to herbicides, which many people uh, see negatively, and it's associated to GMOs. But uh, that exists regardless of whether it's a GMO or not. There are spontaneous mutations. Uh, and above all, very often, it was by induced mutagenesis. For example, the Italian rice paddies include uh, rice. I'm not going to give the name because it's also a brand. Uh, but there's a big company, an international one, and uh, they are resistant to herbicides. Uh, uh, and the ones that were obtained by transgenesis uh, have to undergo a series of checks. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult for them to reach the market, uh, while the ones uh, that have a chemical mutagenesis uh, uh, are not. It's ridiculous, because if resistance to herbicide in itself is a problem, whatever the process uh, was contained, if the fear is that it will transfer from the plants elsewhere is regardless or uh, uh, separate from the process. Uh, the thing, we, situation becomes even more paradoxical with editing because editing contains mutation which are identical to the spontaneous mut mutations uh, or which uh, could uh, be obtained with induced mutagenesis. Uh, so, and in fact, there are people who would like to see the European Commission to finance uh, the development of methods uh, to trace uh, the editing products, which is an oxymoron because uh, they're identical. And it's impossible to uh, tell one identical product from the other. And it's not quite clear why they are so hell-bent on it, um, possibly because, once again, we can't perceive uh, the advantages that this technology may give us, uh, advantages uh, which do not only concern aspects uh, such as increasing production, but uh, which uh, can in particular refer to how you can reduce the impact uh, that agriculture has on the environment we live in. These are the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, the UN has said it is agriculture and uh, reducing uh, the levels of hunger. It means producing more but using less. This was a surprise. I wasn't expecting it here. My question is a bit argumentative. Who pays for the OGM studies and how does the funding affect uh, or the outcome of research? How much of what they say is true and how much isn't and how do we understand it? Oh yes, this is a question. 
Well, technologies initially were developed by research carried out in public agencies, uh, and then the large companies stepped in. Currently, there is a situation where only the large companies are producing uh, GMOs. It's partly a consequence, or is mostly a consequence of legislation. If you want to um, take a product uh, and market it, uh, it's about 150, 100 million to get it on the market to uh, the hyper regulamentation or hyper ruling, I should say. Um, has led to this, and in particular with genome editing, I think we've got to try and avoid this mistake. In terms of uh, who funds what, uh, the European Union has funded uh, research on the safety of uh, GMO products. So this is public research. Uh, then somebody might think that we are all work for multinationals, but uh, this uh, is a hypothesis uh, that in Europe we also have an agency that, uh, which is EFSA. People say it's not independent, but actually it was established uh, to be an independent agency based on scientific evidence on safety to guarantee that what we eat is safe. Thank you very much. And it's in Parma and not in Finland, as others would have wanted. So we should really be proud. I was saying that environmental sustainability is a major problem. Many people don't want to hear that agriculture is one of the great polluters, but that is what it is. Agriculture uses 90% of the water we have uh, and 70 percent of the consumed water. If we were able to reduce the use of water, this would help us solve a problem that in the future is only going to get worse. Agriculture um, produces CO2 and uh, energy because of the fertilizers it uses. Again, if we were able to reduce the use of fertilizers and have plants that were able to benefit uh, from existing fertilizers might make this problem easier. Agriculture uses a lot of chemical products uh, to help plants defend themselves. Were we to get the consumers uh, not only to pay for the product, but also for the externalities of the product, that is to say the indirect costs, uh, it will be very, very expensive, and these are costs that we don't pay for, are paid for by the planet, and the planet is seeing the impact, and this is something we see every day. So the problem of environmental sustainability is a real problem, and it can be solved in many manners, but it cannot disregard uh, what uh, genetic uh, novelties um, uh, have to offer. An example that I wish to go to closing presentation is that of vine growing. Uh, vines uh, are a sector that has not used genetics because the varieties that we grow now are the same ones that we used two, three, and in some cases even 500 years ago. What is the result of all that? The result is uh, that the plants uh, that produce the good wine cannot no, can no longer defend themselves from en their enemies, which are mainly fungi. In our region, Peronospora and Oridium. The fact that vines are sus susceptible to Peronospora and to others, it means that oh, even if it only covers uh, 3% of the land, it uses 65% of all the fungicides uh, in the EU. And you must also think that this is an average which depends also on regions such as Sicily that thanks uh, uh, to its uh, favorable climate where fungus is not a problem. But northern Italy where there's a colder, damper climate, the problem exists. If you look at 2014, and 2016, where it rained a lot, I assure that the problem was really a big problem. We can try and find a genetic prob solution. The question has a very simple answer. Can we? Yes, we can. 
because there are wild species uh, that are not uh, uh, the cultivated ones. In Udine, about 20 years ago, we started a program uh, to have the genetic improvement uh, with various uh, crosses. Traditional system we started uh, with uh, the traditional ones like Sauvignon, Cabernet. We crossed them with varieties uh, that were uh, resistant to Peronospora and we have uh, tens of different types and within them we've selected the ones uh, that uh, were the best, the, the uh, uh, grapes uh, that were of the right size and so on. And then you had to, it was, a, it was really very bad. We had to taste all the wines uh, uh, to decide what the best one. Oh, it was a bit of a problem for my liver, I can assure you, as well as very expensive. It was expensive for the liver, but also for my pocket, I assure you. Now, in the end, it led to a very important result because uh, two years ago we uh, patented 10 new varieties. They've been uh, put on the market uh, and now they are sold by the biggest world producer of Barbatelle that uh, are the vine stock producers. They're very interesting. What is the problem? These varieties uh, cannot be used uh, in the DOC wines, uh, because, or the ones with appellation contrôlée, the AOC ones. Uh, had we used Nebbiolo, they wouldn't be, they no longer Nebbiolo after we've crossed them, and uh, therefore they can't be used for Barolo or Barbaresco or Chianti if it's Brunello. If we wish to solve the problem of s environmental sustainability in agriculture, then you have to use new technologies because these new technologies, unlike uh, the traditional system which generates new varieties, would make it possible for us to preserve the traditional ones because we would directly intervene on, say, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, and we could insert the, the uh, cisgenesis, we could use cisgenesis uh, to introduce a, a gene of resistance uh, and all worked. Uh, with uh, genome editing. These are called susceptibility genes, and it means that we could make all the traditional varieties resistant. It means that tradition and innovation are not in contradiction, but in this case, they go hand in hand. In conclusion, the era we are moving towards uh, is that that we could call uh, the genetic precision improvement or the precise genetic improvement. Uh, we are able to identify the genes uh, that are responsible for the features or characters uh, that we want to modify. We, are not, we don't know them all, but in time we will. Clearly, we have to have adequate investments for fundamental research or basic research. Now, once we have this knowledge, then we will have the technology. We already, in fact, have the technology. We can use a cisgenic approach. We can use editing. We have different tools uh, that make it possible for us uh, to change the segments uh, that we need. We need to produce more, produce better, consume less of what we consume to grow plants. A basic notion, which is really my concluding one, is uh, that uh, it is necessary to have new varieties. We must innovate. We must genetically innovate the plants uh, that we grow. History tells us uh, if plants stay to what they are and things, the environment changes, then plants uh, fail. They don't survive. It's best to modify the plants rather than to modify the environment. In Italy, we have uh, this passion for ancient varieties. Everybody say, ah, yes, we've got to go back to uh, uh, grow what we had 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Ancient varieties are like vintage cars. Uh, they have uh, a niche market for the rich. The fact that some say the fact that they would like to go to the old varieties would be like saying that as from tomorrow, all of us uh, are going to be driving vintage cars. Uh, we would be probably slower. 
we wouldn't be as safe because we wouldn't have uh, airbags, ABSs, so we wouldn't, uh, using more pe petrol, we would uh, have uh, more pollution. And the result would be the same if we turn the clock back in agriculture. If you then think of these decades of discussion and arguments of genetic innovation in agriculture started with the anti-GMOs, uh, but invest uh, nearly all the genetic modification techniques, uh, what one wonders is whether all of this uh, is based on science or whether the scientific arguments uh, are but a screen, but that the real motivations that underlie it are economic motivations, uh, plausible ones. Uh, the important thing is, though, that you have to bring them up and say how things are. My suspicion is uh, that all the or some of the opposition uh, to the use of new technology that are not only genetic technologies, some people say we shouldn't have digital agriculture, for example, is uh, linked uh, to the fact uh, that uh, one wants uh, to maintain a certain model, which uh, some people think uh, could be, uh, for example, threatened by the new technological developments. This is possible. But if this were so, then it would be better for everyone to say it clearly and to think of other systems uh, which are not that uh, that you stop uh, the development of technology uh, to support and help the development of new models uh, so that it may survive uh, along with uh, other uh, models uh, without uh, hindering the possibility of making our agricultural uh, product um, uh, better. We have to make it better, economically more sustainable. Now it's dinner time. Don't forget that when you drink a glass of wine, it's not like this, but in future, what you will be drinking probably has been genetically improved. And I would like to leave you with uh, one last uh, appeal. If uh, Read more. You can go onto this website. The website was created uh, by the Agrarian Genetic uh, Society. It's called Prima Igeni. And don't forget that it is true that our agriculture should refer to tradition, but also our agriculture is uh, full of a genetic modifications in the past, those ancient varieties that some people like to mention, in the past were innovations. Uh, for example, the Senatore Capelli, variation of uh, wheat, uh, he used the results of a great genetic expert, uh, Nazareno Strambelli, who was uh, the predecessor of many of the results because before Norman Borman, he obtained the results uh, uh, that helped uh, uh, world agriculture to leap forward, uh, making it possible for many countries uh, uh, to develop their agriculture. Don't forget that our tradition that we are rightly proud of uh, is based on a lot of innovations. Let us not forget that we have to resume innovation if we wish our agriculture to maintain its level of competitiveness and becomes more economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. Genetics can help us with this, but it can help us only if the regulations will follow logic and not free set ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Professor Morganti. I would now like to invite him to sit down, and I would like to invite you all to ask all the questions that you wish to ask. Our volunteers uh, can stay here, but you have no precedence at this point. You have to raise your hand. There's a question over there. Si vuole alzarsi in piedi? Sì, Buonasera. Eh, Volevo sapere questo. Good evening. I would like to know. 
In traditional techniques, you said that the segment, the modified segment that you wish to insert is uh, inserted in a random manner, while in uh, genome editing, it is inserted exactly where wished. Now, what's the difference? What's the effect? This segment, does it produce that same variation and only that, but in the first case, uh, it is not clear where it will be inserted, while in the second case uh, we know exactly what is going to happen and there are no other interferences. And then I was also wondering, as far as vines are concerned, with genome editing, for example, we could uh, not have to graft it uh, on wild grapes, uh, say, for example, to fight phylloxera, and would it be possible? Could you obtain a vine uh, of the past without <coughs> grafting it? As far as the first question is concerned, let us imagine that we have a gene that is faulty in that plant and that I want to reactivate that gene, for example, with what happens in genetic diseases, because that is often the case. If I use uh, the transgenetic technique, uh, how can I get it to start again? Well, I introduce a new copy of the gene, which is functional. This uh, can uh, be inserted in any particular point, or as in the case uh, of the American patient last week, uh, in a point that I choose because I use editing like that. Now, I get the same result uh, if I, even without introducing exogenous DNA, but simply replacing the base, that led to the loss of function of that gene. So you might ask me, why does this, is the second option better than the first? The result is the same, but the fact is that in the former case, we are subjected to very strict legislation which is partly justified, but partly not. In the second case, uh, since uh, the mutation cannot be distinguished uh, uh, from what could be a spontaneous mutation, many believe uh, that we should not be under the same legislation because clearly the product uh, cannot be distinguished from what we could have obtained with other technologies. As far as the second aspect is concerned, philosopher, that was the question, there is no major research on making vines resistant to philosopher because graphs has solved the problem. While, uh, for example, for the Peronospora, the solution is just by spraying them with chemicals. The other issue, it is true that in the past, vines were not grafted on something else. But the grafting also gives advantages, but it gives flexibility, but it means that I have lots of combinations. Uh, on the same variety can be grafted on different uh, stocks, and uh, so they can be adapted to different soils, uh, and uh, they can, uh, for example, react differently to drought and so on. So from a certain point of view, many people see grafting as a positive rather than as a negative aspect. There's another question. Grazie, mi alzo in piedi così. Io ho due domande da fare. Allora, la prima domanda è che questions. io lavoro in un commercio e sono convinto che vincerei. Trade, and I think that you will win because uh, the public want better products, pro better smell, more resistant uh, practi practice. That's what we have to do in business. And then there's also the selection by the farmers, and they want to improve it. If your neighbor has a better product, I want it too. So I think that the market. Uh, 
will only have the products that you mentioned. The other question that I have is the following. Since uh, that you modify a product uh, and therefore it's better smelling, longer, resist, more resistant, it lasts longer, then we need uh, to produce the bacteria to better digest them because probably this product uh, maybe will not be easily to, to digest or not as easily to digest uh, um, as the pr products that we've had for thousands of years. Uh, and I'm referring to what we're saying in the last conference, the conference in the previous week uh, about bacteria. We also need to be able to digest this product. On the first point, I just want to say that I hope that the matter will go in that direction, that is to say that these technologies will be used. But I would just like to add that in this game, if you want to see it as a game where there are winners or losers, I don't play it. It's farmers and consumers. I'm a scientist. I can only give my opinion. For me, whether you win or lose from a scientific point of view is not so important. What is important for me is uh, that the scientific evidence is uh, represented in the correct manner. There's a scientific uh, level, uh, then there are other levels which are like uh, economics. Uh, politicians can make choices, they can say yes or no, but they should not misuse the science to justify their choice. If they want to say no, they have to say no and take the responsibility for what they say, because in 20 years we will see whether they made the right choice and they will have to answer their voters as far as the digestibility is concerned and the fact that you want to modify bacteria. Well, modifications, the modifications we're talking about, in theory, should not change a lot, should not change the nutritional features of uh, the food Se that we use, but some of the fears that you have are linked, to, for instance, uh, to many of the rumors, uh, such as uh, its modern genetic uh, in have caused uh, uh, celiac disease uh, or uh, gluten problems. So there's a very exhaustive document on our website uh, that puts together all the scientific evidence uh, on modern and ancient wheats, uh, uh, gluten intolerance, uh, celiac disease, and the answer is that there is no relationship between genetic improvement, uh, modern varieties, and these problems. Uh, this is what science tells us. Uh, I must say that what you said might be fascinating. I think that to intervene on the microbioma, that is to say all the bacteria, is the future for medicine, and it might help us to solve many problems. Last but not least, the problem of obese people, which is due to overfeeding. But I also think that it's slightly separate or independent of uh, the genetic modification of plants. One last question. Good evening. It was a very interesting conference uh, today. My question concerns Xylella because um, is a big damage to crops in Apulia. I wanted to know if something could be done to save the olive trees that may be a hundred or more years old, maybe with grafting or editing or whatever. Silella is a very sad case for Italian science, unfortunately, because it's a case, as many others, where the word or the voice of science was not uh, heard, was not listened to. It's an emblematic case uh, of, um, I wouldn't know how to word it, in fact. Uh, it's not lack of attention for science, but uh, the judges, politicians uh, that uh, decided not to listen. Uh, a problem that could have been solved is a problem which is spreading. In this case, uh, if you, again, uh, the Academia de Lince has written a very comprehensive report uh, that uh, discusses Xylella, and it would have been enough uh, 
far uso di quelle norme che erano state suggerite to dalla use the legislation that, that the European Commission had suggested in a timely uh, manner to solve the problem problems or limit it. The problem is not only referred to the olive trees because it can infect other species too. For example, in some parts of the world, it also affects uh, vines and the fear, the terror is that it could in fact infect vines and that means that all the national industry could uh, sink. So it goes well beyond olives, which is a big problem in itself. Apparently, they have identified varieties that had already been developed years ago for very different reasons that are more tolerant of the varieties that are currently cultivated. But we'll have to see this might solve the problem for the olive trees, but not necessarily the spread of Silella, which could in any case uh, be present, and this uh, would continue to leave us with the problem that it could infect more hosts. So I don't know if it's the right solution. The right solution was right from the beginning to pull the plants up and fight against the vector, which is a small insect. This was what recommended, and this is what we decided not to do. But then there's also a problem of communication, because these difficult topics uh, possibly have very um, big interest, big financial interest, uh, but they're topics which, in any case, people follow. So maybe to talk about it, we should start with that, uh, so because uh, we have to be aware. A little provocation, that video that we saw on the editing of the genome could seem a bit of advertising in the eyes of somebody who's a bit skeptical. I don't know if it be, can be considered convincing. Could it not polarize positions and debates? We could debate this uh, at length. Uh, no, we can't because it's finishing. I said that, that it's an anomaly that a scientific society has to do this, but it's an anomaly which is justified by the paradoxical situation that we've had. What the better or best media campaign is to change public opinion, which unfortunately is very strong and very powerful is a topic uh, which one might think about. As a scientific community, we made mistakes in the past, but I don't think that uh, it's all our fault. Uh, during Expo, we uh, said that we were very sorry, but I don't know the only ones who bear responsibility. I think that there is also somebody who used uh, this situation for economic reasons. It's not a just multinationals uh, who have uh, financial interests. And in Italy, unfortunately, we take organizations uh, that are like trade unions, uh, but they do the interests of uh, their members, and this is a very dangerous confusion. I was lying. There's time for one more question. I don't come from business, but one of the things that I'm very curious about uh, as far as the breeding of agriculture is what are the points of view of uh, the uh, farmers fluid, and of the consumers uh, of making le varietà più prestigiose del nostro the most prestigious varieties of our uh, vine portfolio because it's an added value sia proprio, very, which sia is very important for our country. Quindi, uh, so quanto sarebbero bene accette dal punto di vista dei produttori how do you think varieties that would make a certain type of product more democratic, uh, would they be welcomed by the farmers? Uh, we have farmers and vine growers, uh, wine growers, uh, who ask us, we've got cues of them. They are in favor of this. Uh, it wouldn't make it possible to 
for others to make Barolo, because Barolo is linked to a particular terroir. The only advantage is that uh, the Barolo people could say, we respect the environment, we don't use chemistry, or we use less chem or fewer chemical products. And I think this is an added value that can be sold, and it's uh, um, something which is very important. The problem is also a different impact. For example, if we take the area of Prosecco, there's a boom in Prosecco. Prosecco is worth, I think, 3 billion euros. They sell 500 million bottles, and they're going to double that the number of bottles being sold. What has this led to? The fact that the everywhere they're planting the vineyards, which is called Glera for Prosecco, in many areas, they go close to the areas. And you've probably seen it. It was on the TV on report, but it focused on the fact, although it wasn't uh, very good as a whole, it says we shouldn't use uh, fungicides because we don't want our houses to be so close uh, uh, to areas where you use that many chemical products. So if uh, we could make it the glare resistant, there would be, the problem would be solved. And all the area of the Prosecco uh, could suddenly become an area of a biological or organic agriculture. The aim, uh, which is that to reduce uh, chemistry is not only for organic agriculture. Everybody wants this, but somebody, some people are more fundamentalist and think there's only one solution, while we think that there are many different tools and that we have to use them all. I think that's a perfect message to close the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Morganti.